So welcome everyone uh, uh, to um, the, uh, uh, the the flagship opening of the AAA's uh, Gateway Remote Observatory. Uh, this has been an incredible uh, uh, sequence of, of events that sort of led to this project's uh, uh, fulfillment and in incredibly record time. Um, uh, Stan and I and, and Antoine Rabot, I think, uh, first discussed this at NEIF in April of, of, of this year. And it went really quickly from concept to reality in probably the quickest time anything has ever happened in the AAA. Uh, and we are really, really proud of that. And I really uh, have to extend you know, an incredible thank you to, to Stan and Preston uh, and the other members of the, uh, of, of the Gateway Committee, in particular, like Matt, uh, Matt Aggie and, uh, and, and Andrew, We've done a great job um, uh, starting us off, and and of course uh, 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 we can't uh, fail to to, to thank uh, Parker Bossier, our uh, webmaster and, and and tech guru, who's been behind the scenes uh, making all this happen. So we're super excited uh, to bring this to the club and to bring this to everyone. Uh, we think it's going to be a great a tool, not just for uh, enjoyment by uh, all members of the club at all different levels, but also uh, as a way to reach the, the broader community and to do community outreach and, and sort of citizen science and, and hopefully get younger people in New York City and, and elsewhere and engaged uh, in doing um, and learning about astronomy. So without further ado, I wanna uh, turn it over to Stan, who's the uh, committee head um, of the uh, Gateway uh, Remote Telescope. Uh, and uh, take it away, Stan. Yeah, I'm Stan Onda, and we're going to start out with a short video that was compiled by Preston Staley. So take it away, Preston. Yeah, so this uh, they asked me to do a little intro video, and uh, this this video reflects the Herculean efforts, I think, uh, of three people, Stan Honda, Anton Ribot, and John Kessianowitz, who went down and trekked the uh, landscape of Texas to get to the Dark Sky Observatory. It's kind of a two-part thing. It reflects... Uh, their efforts to do it. And, you know, we're all fascinated. The, only, uh, the reason we're all here tonight is because we love the cosmos. We're we're drawn to it. We want to learn about it. We want to uh, understand it. And so first part of it is their efforts. And the second part of it is why we're doing this to, to try and put together a connection with the cosmos. And so here we go.
great. Thank you, Preston. Very, very nice. And that was some trip up that uh, Antoine and I took to Fort Davis and setting up, um, helping set up the uh, the small AAA telescope, uh, which I'll get into. So uh, I'll introduce myself again. I'm Stan Onda, AAA board member and moderator for the AAA Astrophotography Google Group and chair of the Remote Telescope Committee. Good evening and welcome to our presentation of the AAA Gateway Remote Telescope. We're calling it Gateway for two reasons. First, because of its location in an incredibly dark sky on a mountaintop in West Texas, which opens up a much deeper view into the cosmos. And second, because it's located 10 degrees farther south in latitude than New York City, giving us access to deep sky wonders that we simply cannot see from our location. Our Gateway Remote Telescope, or GRT, is a direct offshoot of the Astrophotography Group. We are one of the most active groups within the club, judging by the number of emails generated on the Google Group. We also have an Instagram feed. Check it out at AAANY underscore astrophotography. Through the AAA, there are classes available if you have an interest in astrophotography. Right now, Mario Rosenthal is conducting another in his urban astrophotography series, this time on planetary imaging. In January, I'll do another course on night sky photography using ordinary digital cameras and lenses for wide angle landscapes. We know that amateur astronomers have a tough time in the Northeast consistently viewing the heavens. What if you had access to the dark skies over West Texas from your own computer? What if you could join a free monthly guided tour of deep sky objects from the comfort of your home? What if you're a budding astrophotographer or want to do deep sky imaging but can travel far? The answer to all these questions is a newly unveiled Gateway Remote Telescope. We are offering this as a benefit of AAA membership. On your screen now is the GRT landing page. Uh, so check out uh, check out the, the program and more details on the AAA.org website. Just go to the Gateway page. Through an arrangement with the amateur astronomer named John Kasinowicz, who you saw in the video, the AAA has exclusive access to an excellent high-end telescope, camera, and mount at the Dark Sky Observatory remote facility near Fort Davis, Texas. It shares the same clear sky as the world-famous McDonald Observatory in West Texas. See the GRT page for a list of equipment. I can tell you there were jaws dropping from remote telescope committee members when we saw this list. We went one step further and attached our own small refractor uh, donated by Antoine Ribot to the, uh, to the mount that, that John had his telescope on. So now that we, we have two telescopes to choose uh, from for imaging and live streaming, here's a better view of Antoine's uh, AT60 telescope and the ZW camera that uh, we have attached. The telescope rig is accessed online via the NINA Astrophotography Imaging Program. We'll be able to remotely photograph deep sky objects and present live stream views of what the telescope can see from a latitude of 30 degrees north, 10 degrees farther south than New York City. Images and data from the telescope's camera are downloaded to a Google Drive. We have four tiers of participation available, so every AAA member uh, can join the project. Those at the observer level can join for free and attend online lectures and demos with real-time view. The first paid tier, the data, data subscriber level, can download all the data obtained by both telescopes and process the images at their own pace. We'll be offering AAA classes in image processing to help Target selectors can pick an object or two each month that will be photographed when they are at their peak location in the sky. Selectors can also download everything available to subscribers. The top telescope operator tier will be able to fly the scopes, choose their own objects to photograph, image the selectors target, and help with the live stream programs. A note here, uh, there is now only one operator slot left. All participants will eventually have access to all the data gathered by the telescopes to download and process. 
The top three tiers are available at prices that are very competitive with commercial online remote telescopes. Depending on the company, most three to four hour imaging sessions uh, for one object cost from $100 to $400 per, per, per session. Compare that to the GRT prices for a whole year of participation. And remember the high-end rig exclusive to AAA GRT participants. Another comparison is the, the dark sky brightness. Using the Boreal numeric scale that measures the sky, night sky brightness of a particular location, New York City is nine, the brightest measurement, as you can imagine. North-South Lake and the Catskills, where the AAA goes for out-of-town observing, is rated four to five. The mountains outside Fort Davis, Texas, are Boreal one or two, about as dark of a sky as you can get. In addition to the two telescopes mentioned, GRT participants will have access to deep sky object data from a third telescope, a very high-end and rare Cerevolo 300, run by John Kucinowicz. Here is M51 from the Cerevolo scope. We won't be able to operate or select Cerevolo targets, but we'll have a nice library image data uh, that you could process. So we'll have a growing library of, of uh, data files from these three telescopes. Even if you have your own astrophotography uh, telescope set up, wouldn't it be nice during uh, the colder months or when northeast clouds uh, set in to be able to continue imaging night sky uh, deep, or deep sky uh, objects? We're all passionately involved in gazing up into the sky to the universe beyond the bounds of our home world, either visually through, the, through an eyepiece uh, or by collecting far-flung photons and creating beautiful images to display. So we, we hope with the Gateway Remote Telescope, AAA members can have a new way to explore the cosmos. We'd like to thank John Kucinowicz for the use of his telescope rig and uh, Linda Fowler-Thomas for the excellent training and technical advice. Both of them have been instrumental in guiding us uh, through this project. Uh, so now we'll demonstrate how the GRT works and what, we, uh, what we've seen so far uh, about West Texas. I think we'd take a few questions, if, if there are any. Yeah, and also people can uh, type a question into the chat, uh, and we'll uh, we'll take those questions as we go. I think okay. they can also raise, raise a hand, and then we can unmute them, I think. That's also a possibility. Yeah. Are, are there any questions, so Preston? Looks like we've got three questions in Q&A. Yeah, so there's a question on live view. So we're planning on doing a monthly live view from the telescope. So it'll be one time, it'll be once a month. We'll obviously pick a clear night that will do it. Uh, and we'll we'll try to sort of make it as interactive as we can. So like we'll talk about, you know, what, it's, what are some of the objects up in the sky that, that evening? People will be able to say, hey, can I, can we go see this object or that object? And if it's available, we can slew to it. And hopefully there'll be some interesting uh, phenomena going on, maybe a supernova in a galaxy, or maybe um, you know a comet or something, and we can talk about that. So we'll try to make it both topical in the sense of what's going on in that particular month, as well as interactive. And depending on how many people we have, we'll try to we will try to accommodate as many questions and as many views as we possibly can. Stan, could you uh, go back and show the portal sky again? Because I think a lot of people didn't see that. The GRT is not. In, well, sure. te technically, it's the same mountain range, but I think it's a few miles away from um, the McDonald Observatory. Isn't that right, Stan? Um, this, the, yeah, this, yeah. Let's see. So there's a question on how time gets allocated. So we um, we have. So if you think about it, there's 30 days a month, right? Not all 30 days will be clear, but let's assume that they were. We have 10 people who are operating the scope. We want to give them at least two nights uh, a month. Um, just because of the cloudy nights. If they're all clear, people could get three nights a month. And um, people who are at the target selector level would be able to um, pick targets, and then those targets would, would work through um, the, uh, the different operators. So the idea would be if someone's an operator, um, they, would, they would have the option of shooting their own target that evening or picking through uh, a target that maybe someone from the target selector uh, list put in. Um, and the idea in the future would be that those higher tiers, because they pay more, uh, would have access to that data for a, a, 
for a, for a certain period of time, maybe a few weeks or something before um, the data subscriber tier w would, would get access. And remember, the, the money that we're charging here, although it's nominal, uh, is really to help us fund the cost of the telescope because it's not free. We are paying something for it. Uh, we're paying, as Stan pointed out, significantly below anything that you could do on your own uh, in terms of either renting a peer or uh, uh, paying one of these um, uh, online services, uh, which by the way, oftentimes you can't even operate the telescope. So it's it's super duper in cheap relative to that, but there's still some cost and you know, we are a, a nonprofit, so we are trying to defray that cost. That's why there are um, uh, paid tiers. Uh, but we we do plan to allow people if the, at the lowest level, the thirty dollar level, it's a it's a one time payment, and you're going to have access to all the data. So, in in one year's time, we've only had the scope for a month, and as Stan said, we already have one full year of data from the Cerebolo scope. There's probably a hundred gigabytes of data there, and I estimate that. By the end of the year, we'll probably have, you know, you know, probably eight to ten terabytes of data, if not more. So there's going to be a lot of data that this thing generates. Uh, which, you know, if you're a data subscriber, uh, you'll have access to that data forever. Uh, it's going to be your data. You can be able to do whatever you want with it. Dan, uh, also we're getting a question from Gary Schnettler about he wants to know the focal length of the AP-175 and the AT-60, and also another entity wants to know if um, how do they control the scope? And that would be, you know, the sure. first tier. But uh, go ahead. So the AP one seventy five, it's got um, a focal reducer on it. So I think it's f six point one, if I'm not mistaken. So it's about thousand fifty, thousand sixty millimeter focal length. Uh, and the AT sixty is is a is a three hundred and sixty millimeter focal length. It's the scopes are both on um, a ten micron three thousand mount, which is a, a superb mount. Um, I think we'll show you a, a couple of, uh, a, a, of shots. Uh, one of them of the jellyfish nebula, which uh, Stan had up there. Those were uh, 900 second exposures, um, and I think you know you, we we can do that effectively even unguided. Uh, I think that might have been guided, but the, the mount is so precise that we could do 10 minute, 15 minute exposures unguided. So it's a really, really world class, top tier uh, equipment. But John, John Cassianowitz also chimes in and says, please let the group know that I am not charging any fees for the use of my rig. The fee is solely paid to the observatory owner for releasing the the peer space. And my hope is that this and other rigs uh, is that folks can learn about imaging and DSO. So he's truly a uh, a charitable person when it comes to, to uh, understanding a cosmos and connecting to it. And David Shepard wants to know, will the data include calibration frames, darks, flats, et cetera? Yes, it will include that. Um, there's no software that you need to get. Um, everything is is co-located on the scope. You basically just log in remotely, just like just like a Zoom session. You use a program called AnyDesk, and you have full access to the um, to controlling the scope. Um, that's that's at the operator level, uh, and we would just we would train you uh, 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 so that you can use it safely uh, um, uh, and not damage anything, right? Like anything like that. Um, any other questions? So I think we're I think we should probably move on to some images, and we'll uh, pick up these questions as we go. Sounds like a plan. Okay, great. So Fredo and I are going to go through the uh, a few of the few of the images. We'll start with uh, start with this look uh, of the sky from the location near West te Texas. The first object is going to be uh, the triangular galaxy, and uh, Alfredo will tell us a little bit about the uh, about the objects. Do you want to start with that standard? Do you want to uh, zoom? Yeah, on yeah. It? Go go ahead, and then I'll just I'll zoom in on the object. So what one of the so. We've we've only been we've only probably had like I think ten or twelve imaging sessions with the scope. One of the first images imaging sessions we did was was um, M thirty three, the Triangulum Galaxy, uh, which is um, a, a, a spiral galaxy. Actually, it's 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 in it's it's part of the Milky Way's local group. Everyone knows Andromeda. Andromeda is about two point two um, million light years away, but Andromeda is about is about fifty percent larger than the Milky Way. Uh, the Triangulum Galaxy is about is about three million light years away, and it's about half the size of the Milky Way. It's about fifty thousand um, light years in diameter. 
So it's a smaller galaxy, but it is part of our group. It is gravitationally bound uh, with um, with both the Milky Way and, and Andromeda. And, um, you know, we have <clears throat> this one image here, um, which was primarily uh, um, uh, taken uh, with um, RGB frames. So that's one of the things we we um, we didn't mention, but it's important to, to to comment on. So there there are uh, three telescopes, two of which are actively operated. The Cerevolo uh, is a telescope um, that we have a year's um, worth of data that we've that we that that we've acquired, which for processing. Uh, that is that's mono data. So in other words, um, it's 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 a it's a black and white camera uh, that takes uh, um, uh, images through filters. And um, the the main scope that we're using, the Astrophysics 175, also has a monochrome camera, and that also takes uh, images through various filters. Uh, and the little scope um, that Antoine, our club member, donated, um, that has a color camera, and that takes images basically just in color, but at much smaller focal length. This particular galaxy was done with the AP175. It was done um, using... Um, uh, the, mono, the, 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 mono, uh, the monochrome uh, CCD camera, uh, primarily composed of red, green, and blue uh, frames. There was, I think, a total of 142 frames, of which 12 were also hydrogen alpha. And if you look on, if you look on this uh, on this galaxy, you can see the red blotches. Those red blotches are star forming regions, or what we would call H um, hydrogen alpha uh, H2 zones, uh, and that's primarily um, <clears throat> through the um, because of the hydrogen alpha filter, uh, that sort of uh, uh, um, uh, brings those out. That was the reason why we we did some hydrogen alpha on it. But um, it's it. This is a, a very classical spiral uh, uh, galaxy, um, different than the Milky Way. The Milky Way is a spiral galaxy, but it's a barred spiral, so it's a slightly different structure. Uh, but again, um, this galaxy is a is is a great object um, uh, to sort of shoot with your backyard telescope. And from our location uh, in dark in, in, in Texas uh, with the dark skies, you can really bring out the color uh, and um, the the sort of the sort of the detail in the galaxy, which you can see here. The average frames here were 120 second frames. The other important thing is that the camera that we're using is a CCD camera. CCD is kind of like old technology, so it's a very high end CCD camera. But for a lot of us now, we're we're using CMOS cameras for our scopes, and we'll talk all about this probably in in a, in in, in, in a future class that we'll do. Um, so if this is all sort of gobbledygook, <laughs> stay tuned and we'll, and we'll, and we'll get more detail. But, um, a lot of us today are using CMOS cameras, which, um, which are a, a much faster in terms of acquiring the data, but the CCD is still, you know, the, 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 the workhorse of science. And so this is really more of a scientific camera. And so the, the data quality is extremely, extremely good. Next object is the uh, Jellyfish Nebula. Right. This one, this is the one that we also showed in the very beginning. Um, our uh, club member, uh, Andrew um, Warner, uh, one of our one of our uh, operators, uh, took this uh, image. It has his first image also on the scope, and he processed it just wonderfully. Um, <clears throat> and the um, Jellyfish Nebula is actually, it's an, it's an IC, the, the catalog number is IC443, uh, if you like type that into Stellarium. Um, and it's called the jellyfish nebula because it kind of looks a bit like a jelly, jellyfish nebula, but it's actually a, a, a supernova remnant. Uh, it's in the constellation Gemini. It's about 5,000 light years from Earth. Um, and w what's really neat about this one is that you can't quite see it, but right here in the very center, if you look right in, right in the center there, um, there's basically a, a rotating neutron star. A neutron star, of course, is the remnant of a supermassive star that, that basically went supernova and it was it, it, it was so massive, but not super massive enough to be a black hole. And so it, co it coalesced down into a neutron star. And um, that neutron star is emitting a tremendous amount of energy. Uh, and that energy effectively is 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 going into the, in, into the shell or the remnants, the sort of the life guts of that star that were blown out, which is this whole shell that you see, uh, and it's illuminating it. Um, the the colors whenever you see these kind of these kind of images. The colors are really kind of representations of, of different uh, wavelengths, um, and there's a bit of artistic um, sort of uh, let's call it sort of just imagination that's used. Um, 
in, in how we paint those colors. And so you map cer certain of the wavelengths to, 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 to certain colors. You'll map, let's say, hydrogen alpha to, let's say, red, you, or you can map it to blue, depending on how you like the color, the color mix. Uh, you'll map um, uh, ionized oxygen or, or O3 to green or to, uh, or, 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 or to blue, for, for instance. And then, and then finally, you'd map um, silicon. And these are all basically uh, different wavelengths that, are, that light is created as the light from the energetic um, uh, sort of pulsar, or in, in some cases, it can be a, a massive star, as that energy hits this, um, the, these molecular clouds or the remnants of the, of the star, and they basically excite the molecules in those, in, 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 those, um, in those atoms to effectively jump different states. You remember from chemistry, all um, atoms have sort of electron shells, and as and as and as um, the the electrons move up and down those shells, they emit wave they emit photons of light at different wavelengths, and that's basically represented um, by this sort of filament the filamentary nature that you see here. It's basically lighting up. It's almost like you know a spotlight that's kind of like in a smoke. Imagine like you're you're outside and it's like a there's like a you have your barbecue on and there's like smoke coming out of the barbecue, and your kid comes out with a flashlight and sort of shoots the flashlight into the into the smoke. It's basically doing that exact same thing. It's kind of like lighting that up, and that's kind of what we're seeing here. So this, uh, can you tell us when this was, this image is very recent. When was this captured? I think this was the second week of November, if I'm not mistaken. So it's like 5,000 years and a couple of weeks. Yeah, exactly. The light was 5,000 years and a couple of weeks. That's correct. So uh, we have a few questions I want to get to before uh, we, we move on. Daniel Kraft is asking, are there plans for a, a messier marathon in March? It is the telescope in the path of the upcoming 2024 solar eclipse. Uh, messier marathon, maybe. I, I I haven't thought about it. I think it's possible. I don't know. Um, there, we have some issues in terms of how low the telescope can point. But if we could do a messier marathon from uh, you know the, the Catskills, we could probably do one uh, in Texas, I, I, I'm pretty sure. Uh, Eclipse? I don't think so, but I'm not exact. I'm not sure. I have to. It's out. It's outside the path of totality, but it's. Uh, I think if you were in in Port Davis, the, the eclipse would probably be about 90, 80, 85 to ninety percent uh, partial. So that'd be pretty deep eclipse. Uh, Jason Jason Cousin is asking, uh, in the event of a discovery, how do you anticipate handling that? Well, the um, so. The legalese behind this, and Stan can kind of uh, uh, talk a bit about this, but technically the images belong to the AAA. So um, if you were to discover something, it would be, you know, John Smith or 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 or, or Mary Smith discovered a supernova, Kurt, you know, from data courtesy of the AAA. So you could still have your name, but we would ask that you sort of attribute the data uh, to the AAA. Is that is that right, Stan? Yeah, yeah, then that's kind of in line with the way the way a lot of remote telescopes were, uh, uh, work because the the AAA will then ultimately uh, re retain the copyright to the uh, information, uh, but but uh, everybody is free to uh, create their own images and then that that becomes their their own image. Uh, but discovery would be a pleasant surprise and a I think a pleasant headache to deal with if we had to deal with something like that. Another question is how many image uh, processing classes do you anticipate being offered throughout the year and would the content be aimed at both beginner and experienced data processors? Good question from E. Smith. Great question. So so um, uh, the club offers <clears throat> Urban Astronomy 101 and 102. Um, uh, Maury Rosenthal and I started those classes and, and Maury's become sort of the guru on offering those classes. Um, those are run... Um, Usually, uh, Maury will run the planetary imaging class now at this time of year because from from our skies here in the New York City area, this is the best time of year to capture both Saturn and Jupiter. And then he'll normally run um, the introduction uh, to uh, deep sky astrophotography in January, February. I believe that's when it's slotted. And then we're thinking amongst ourselves here that we'll run uh, another class that'll be like a more advanced class to do to, to, to produce images like you're seeing here of Andrew's fabulous jellyfish nebula um, with the data that we're collecting. So um, that's kind of the game plan. So that's kind of one of the things we'll offer. Um, and then, of course, you know, depending on demand and what people would like, we can do more. But 
that's kind of what we're thinking of teeing up. And um, Stan, Stan also does his night sky photography classes, which I think he'll do in January, right, Stan? Right, that's scheduled for January and February. Arthur Linker wants to know uh, what model camera is being used and how many pixels per frame. All right, so um, off the top of my head, it's a, it's an FLI. I think it's a sixteen eight hundred, and I know John will will will, will pipe up and correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, camera, I think it's four thousand um, by like twenty eight hundred or something like that. Um, I could be wrong. Four four thousand pixels by three thousand, something like that. Stand you know offhand, top of your head. That's it. Yeah, that sounds about right. Yeah, that's on the main. That's on the main scope. On the little scope, it's a ZWO two two thousand six hundred, which is an IMX five seven one sensor, and that's like sixty two hundred by like forty eight hundred or something like that. But that's a color camera. That's got a Bayer a Bayer matrix, uh, so that the, the the data coming off of that camera is, is already got color information, whereas the data coming off the FLI camera again is being shot through various filters, and so it's going to be an um, in, in 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 single uh in, in single color bands as it comes out so it'll be it'll have to be combined um to get color images the and, zw the zwo camera also is it's roughly the size of the, of an APS-C uh chip in a consumer digital camera so it's a relatively large large sensor yeah and the uh the FLI is almost a full frame i think it's just shy of the of the of the di of the a diagonal of a full frame if i'm not mistaken Linda Thomas Fowler says it's an FLI ML sixteen two hundred. Yeah, thanks, Linda. <laughs> and uh, um, what uh, anonymous says, I have to hop up the Zoom. Will I be able to watch this later? Yes, we're record. We're recording this. We're recording it, so it'll, it'll be up on our YouTube uh, AAA site. All right. So we go to the next next object. <clears throat> We'll be looking at the Flaming Star Nebula, and this is something that was also uh, imaged by the the AT60 uh, AAA telescope. Yeah, so um, so this image, um, as soon as Stan pops it up there, so this was one of the first images we captured <clears throat> with the small scope, um, which is um, which is sort of a, a riding. Um, Riding on the same rail as the a, as the AP one seventy five, we have a, we have a slight misalignment between these two. So the uh, the original idea was to have these two scopes perfectly aligned, which means that we could do two images, that we could do two cameras at the exact same time. So theoretically, we could let's say take uh, an image like this one that you're seeing here of these two nebula, the uh, uh, the upper left nebula that's um, IC four hundred five or the Flaming Star Nebula, and the lower nebula. Uh, is NGC 1893, um, which is another emission nebula. So theoretically, the, the idea that we had was that we could have the big scope pointing at, let's say, one of those nebulas, and the little scope would be able to capture the whole frame that you're seeing here. Unfortunately, we have a slight misalignment. That's something we're going to have to fix. Um, <clears throat> the little scope also doesn't have any dark frames currently. So this image was processed with no dark frames. So this is just the raw data. Um, with no calibration. So the data is actually pretty good. Uh, and it's really a testament to just how spectacular the night skies are. For those of us here in the Northeast who shoot uh, with uh, CMOS cameras and color cameras, I bet you you're looking at this image and your mouth is probably dropping because there's no gradients. If you look at this image, there's no gradients at all, which is which is just astounding because you know there's no, there's no light pollution or very little light pollution. Um, and so it's really fantastic just from an astrophotography standpoint it's just how clean this this data is with this with this one camera with no calibration. So the the, um, the nebula on the upper left, as I said, is called the Flaming Star Nebula. It's about fifteen hundred light years, and it's also an emission nebula. If you look, there's a there's a really bright blue star in the very in the very sort of upper upper right hand corner of that nebula, um, and uh, that's um, alpha that's that's alpha epsilon origa. Because uh, this nebula is in the, in the constellation Auriga, and that's a super giant blue star, and that star is actually um, spinning at like 200 times faster than uh, our sun, and it's about 15 times larger than our sun, and it's basically emitting all this radiation. And um, oftentimes, when you see uh, um, nebula like this, they're usually they're usually star forming regions, and so this is a nebula that actually gave birth to this star, and the star now is ignited. 
and it's basically blowing the nebula away. And that energy that the star is producing is basically illuminating the, the nebula. That's why we call this an emission nebula, because again, the energy from the star is kind of blowing the, the nebula away um, as it sort of like, um, as it's, as it's effectively uh, growing. As a super giant blue star with 15 solar masses, it too will explode in a, in a spectacular supernova at, at some point in the future. Uh, and, and then we'll basically have yet another nebula <laughs> to look at. Um, you know, at some point, probably 20 million years from now, or something like that. The uh, the the lower <clears throat> the lower uh, um, nebula in here, if you scroll down there, Stan, um, is, that, is actually a star cluster. If you look uh, in the center there, you see all those all those bright stars. There's, a, there's actually technically about a hundred um, uh, bright blue stars in there, and those are all new, newly born stars, uh, and um, and it's also, uh, you know, the fact that um, this nebula uh, is, you know, the stellar nursery that gave birth to all those stars, uh, and there are currently other stars that are being born in this in in, the, in this nebula. I think this next pair is nice. Uh, Fireworks galaxy. So this is another image that we took with the AT60 uh, scope. Now, just think about this: the AT60 telescope. This you have, we have two telescopes that we're running here. Uh, John's um, Astrophysics 175, <clears throat> which is a one of a kind, extremely expensive, super well configured, handmade telescope. Um, I'm going to guess here, but I'm going to say it's probably a, a forty thousand dollar telescope. Um, and riding right next to it is our little telescope that Antoine gave to the club. He actually won it, I think, at a star party, and it's a like, and it's a four hundred dollar telescope. So this, the image you saw before and the image you see right now were taken with this little $400 telescope. Um, and again, it's a function of just how spectacular the night skies are here that we can get a really high quality image. And because it's a small telescope, the wide field, we can capture really wide angle targets. And so in this particular case, we have two targets that we sort of wanted to capture. Uh, and this was, um, this was an idea that was actually given to us by Joe Napoli. Uh, who's a longtime uh, club member, and he said, "Well, why don't you guys take a, a take an image of um, of the fireworks galaxy and uh, the cluster that's there?" And so that's what we did. And so the 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 big telescope that we have wouldn't be able to capture both of these in the same frame, but the little telescope can capture both of them, which gives a nice contrast. Um, the, the fireworks galaxy, which is that which which is that uh, that like spiral thing that you see here, it's called the fireworks galaxy because it's the galaxy in the night sky that has had has had the most supernovas. Uh, since since we've been tracking supernovas, so it it it, it basically has a, a, a very high frequency of supernova explosions. Uh, it's about 22 million light years away, and uh, the the star cluster uh, and, and NGC 6939 is um, a star cluster that's about 4,500 light years away, and um, you can see in there too that there's a lot of large stars, uh, which makes this 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 cluster different than the cluster you saw before. Is that this cluster? Uh, all of those stars are probably in the later end of their life, right? So the first, the, the the first nebula that we saw before, where we saw all those stars combined and we saw the nebula around it, that's a newly born stellar nursery where those are all young stars that have just been born, and and the molecular cloud that formed those stars is still there. This uh, this this cluster here is actually a very old cluster where all of the stars are in are in old age. Uh, and they've and, and and they're nearing the end of their life, and they've effectively blown away that stellar nursery cloud millions of years ago, and it's basically gone and lost uh, to to our observation. Uh, and so all you have is all of these stars that were sort of born together, and that's usually what's what's nice about a cluster is that you know if they're if 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 it's actually a gravitationally bound cluster like this one, all of the stars are are, are kind of the same the same parent the same parent cloud, and they all kind of grow up and live and die together. So um, that's what we have here. Uh, we're, uh, we got one more question here and then I think we have to move on and close the, close the, uh, the demo here. Uh, uh, Matt Aggie, and forgive me, Matt, if I'm pronouncing your uh, wrong, your, your last name wrong. Not a question, he says, but join the Discord. Stan, you want to talk about that? Oh yeah, we have a, a Discord channel so all the participants can uh, get on the Discord that was that was arranged by uh, Matt, and so we'll have different channels talk for, for both the 
operators to talk about uh, uh, their their plans and what's being what's being imaged, and also the uh, there's we have a processing channel which people uh, who are participating in the program they could get processing questions, uh, ask questions and answer questions, or get their questions answered. And in a few different channels, there's a mean of feed channel that uh, people can uh, get onto, and you basically see the commands from the uh, NINA program, which controls the whole rig uh, as, as someone is on the, on the telescope during the night, uh, sending out the different commands as it, as it uh, d- does the, uh, works the telescope and also uh, does, the, does the photography part of it. So I think we have to move on here now. And uh, one, of, one of the things that we just put up was uh, just yesterday was our gateway gallery and, the, and these images that you've been seeing here are some of the ones that are in there. We, don't, we only have like a half a dozen so far, but uh, if I could share my screen, I got to show you that real quickly. Um, let's see if I could find that. Here we go. So this, as you see, a lot of you have seen this page here, uh, which is the landing page for the telescope. Again, there's different tiers. People are asking about target selection before um, you can join a target selector tier at $150 a year, and that, that'll give you uh, access to picking a lot of different targets. Uh, and then you can subscribe to the data for just 30 bucks a year, which is just a crazy deal. And of course, you can come to these lectures as an observer and learn for free. And uh, But the newest thing that we uh, just installed here is uh, a page with our gateway remote, gateway gallery. And I'll just read here quickly, because this is brand new, just up yesterday. Uh, you, you can view the latest images from the AAA Gateway Remote Telescope located under the dark skies of West Texas. Images are processed by AAA astrophotographers. As the gallery grows, more photographers will be available for downloading, more, more photographs will be available for downloading and to purchase as wall art for your enjoyment and support of the Gateway Telescope project. And we haven't, we don't have any uh, wall art up yet, but people have been stunned by the images and asking about, uh, is there some way we could get these images on our wall or you know whatever? And so we will be doing that. AAA does have a store and there'll be a uh, gateway remote telescope um, uh, section in that for some of this really crazy stuff. And um, so uh, also I th- what we're gonna do here is we're gonna have a little audience participation. So I know there's, there's 80 some of you out there right now and uh, we're going to do something well, everything's new we're doing here. So this is going to be our uh, gateway gallery picture of the month for November. So we have six candidates right here. And uh, it's the, the Triangulum Galaxy, Jellyfish Nebula, Flaming Star, Fireworks Galaxy, the Whirlpool Galaxy, and the Tadpole Nebula. And uh, we'll just go through these real quickly. Um, well, actually, we, we, we reviewed some of them. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, uh, l- let me share another screen here. Hold on a second. So these are the images. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And what I'd like you to do, uh, people in chat or on in the questions, tell us uh, your favorite image. We'll give you 30 seconds to figure it out. This is image one, two, three, four, five and six. So we're going to play this this uh, little movie real quickly while you make your, your decision on it. And uh, and then at the end of this, um, we'll get your votes and we'll uh, let you know, because uh, I think there's like 80, 80 some odd people, we'll, we'll count it up later and then let you all know in an email. So here we go. Get ready to make your choice. Okay, put your pencils down. I hope you've uh, put your answer in the chat. Uh, you could put it in any, you know, any time between now and the next few minutes, I guess. Uh, also, for the kids out there in the audience, because we know they're watching, 
But we have also a QR code that you can use that'll take you to the Gateway Gallery. And from there, you can uh, keep updated on all the amazing images that are coming in. Like uh, like we said, the, these, these recent images have just come in over the last few weeks. So it, it's a lot of fun. And uh, I'm also excited about the idea of you know, discovering things when, when uh, we hear about, say, a supernova someplace that's going off, if we can get the scope on it, we're going to have uh, really uh, uh, very uh, quick data on it that, that people can take advantage of. Okay, so stay on your necks, I guess. <laughs> you know, I, 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 wanted, I thought it would be good to mention the, the classes that are coming up again. Yeah, Mario Rosenthal. He'll have his his uh, deep sky imaging class, uh, his, uh, which he talks really about the uh, essentially what we're doing here with the Rob telescope. So you can learn a lot from him in terms of uh, pretty uh, pretty straightforward imaging. Uh, he's he's uh, he's not real fancy. He doesn't uh, do anything too uh, too complicated or or crazy. And then that should be in the, uh, the early part of 2024. Uh, in January to February, I'm going to do another night sky photography class, and that'll deal with the night sky landscapes, the, uh, the starscapes, um, things like the things that you could do with an ordinary digital camera and just regular lenses, nothing through telescopes. And so that'll be January uh, through February. And, and then uh, just keep a look to the AAA classes or uh, the AAA email that comes out and we'll keep everybody updated. Uh, different classes, and we'll definitely do more image processing classes from uh, from di for different levels that to deal with the all the files that are coming out of our out of our gateway telescope. So I think uh, we're getting to the end of our presentation here. Uh, I think we we were planning on having our next one in January. Uh, Alfredo, you want to talk about that possibility? Yeah, so I think we're we're going to plan uh, in January to do our very first um, monthly sky show. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for that. Um, probably the week of January eighth. Uh, I haven't determined the date. We'll probably um, flag the upcoming week, uh, and we'll probably do that each time. We'll say, okay, it's going to be the week of X, and then we'll give you a, a whole week that we'll do it. And then the week before, probably on that weekend, we'll we'll determine the date because obviously we want to pick a day where it's going to be clear. Uh, so that's going to be the goal. And then what we'll do is we'll basically, um, ask people, you know, ahead of time, what they would like to see, or if there's anything particular, uh, and then we'll also have some ideas of what we might do. And then we'll probably do it from 9, uh, PM Eastern time, uh, to about 11. Uh, and then anyone who wants to, to, to stick around, I think there was, there was a question on the, on the chat earlier about, can you look over the operator's shoulder? That'll be the perfect time to do that. Right. So, you know, during that, and that's free, you can basically just say, hey, can you show me this? Can you show me that? And again, depending on how, unlike this format, we'll probably do it as an open Zoom. So it'll be more interactive. There won't be, you know, people will be able to talk and um, and, and participate more more actively. That's kind of what we're thinking. I think we had a couple comments that the, the chat room seems to be disabled. Uh, so if you wanted to vote, just go ahead and use the Q&A part. Uh, that, that seems to be pretty active. Yeah, we've had like 45 responses already on this, so we'll have to do some tallying. If there's any other questions, right? I think we're pretty much, uh, we, we've uh, got to the end of this uh, in one piece. Yeah, I'd also like to thank the Remote Telescope Committee, all the committee members. We are The, the committee grew over time. We're, we had, I think, some excellent people on the committee who really knew their stuff about the telescopes and uh, how to set up, uh, uh, especially remote things. We had three members who were actually operating remote telescopes of their own, and they were willing to, willing to help us with a lot of input. And uh, it, uh, initially, we were trying to put together an equipment list, and then we we luckily uh, met John Kasinowicz, and and so his, uh, we definitely uh, thank him and uh, Linda Fowler Thomas for the incredible help that they've done to help uh, get this project really, really going. And, uh, this, and Alfredo and Preston have been, uh, I think, part of the backbone of the of this project. And uh, and so the, and the entire committee, I think, has done a, a great job in putting everything together. Uh, 
Uh, so definitely look at the at the uh, website, look at the different tier levels and, and pick a tier and get involved in the project. And thanks very much for thanks very much for coming today. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Uh, you can uh, we have an email address too somewhere. I think it's uh, do we know what that is? Uh, if you have any questions, it's it's just it's gateway at triple dot org. I believe I believe that's the right one. Uh, Parker can correct me if I'm wrong, and that should get uh, uh, that'll go to a central uh, email. Yes, uh, gateway at triple dot org. And uh, we'll be able to answer any any questions through through there. Yeah, that's in the web chat, so you guys can see that there. And Stan just mentioned the uh, the astrophotography group and the Sunday meetups because we'll probably do a lot of stuff with that there as well. Yeah, the good thing about the our astrophotography Google group is that we uh, we initially were meeting in, in person about once a month or so. Uh, during the pandemic, we switched to Zoom meetings, and we're we're continuing with the with the Zooms Zoom meetings. That that seems pretty oh, fairly popular. Uh, so we've been meeting on Sunday afternoons. We kind of move the meeting around sometimes to make it easier for for some people to attend. But uh, we'll have a topic, and we'll have people talking. We 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 did several uh, meetings leading leading up to the annular solar eclipse in October, just talking about eclipse photography and how you might do it. And we'll, we'll definitely do the same leading up to the April, 2024 total solar eclipse. I know that there are, uh, there seems to be quite a few AAA members that are planning to go travel to the center line to, to watch totality. And uh, I'll be one of the people I'll be in Texas with, it sounds like several people will be in Texas as well. Uh, but the, the center, the path of totality stretched across the central part of the country. So there's a lot of places a lot of places to go. So we'll also be, uh, I think, having programs uh, about the remote telescope. Uh, and also there's quite a few people who are very good at the deep sky imaging and the processing. And if uh, if you're really interested in this, uh, send us uh, through the membership portal, just send a request to join the astrophotography Google group. Uh, because it, if, you add, if you put a question on the group, there's going to be six or seven or even more people who are going to answer your question that there's, there's no lack of answers from the group. It's a, I think it's a great group that uh, they both you know, were both, uh, I think, posting photos, talking about both the deep sky images and the, uh, the night sky landscape, Pe people posting stuff, taking with digital cameras. But also people, uh, people use the Google group email to organize uh, informal trips. I mean, the, the, the North South Lake uh, site is a, is a formalized uh, the excursion through the triple a but a lot of people uh on their own they go they go up places different places in the cat skills on a on a weekend on a saturday evening or Friday eat, eat. Uh, and do uh, do some photography or or take telescopes and do do these kind of indians so uh if you're if you're into that and you and uh, you want to find other people who, uh, who are willing to go along and on these small excursions, just uh, join our astrophotography group. Uh, let, let me just make one uh, more push for the uh, total eclipse. April 8th, 2024, uh, we will have a total eclipse that will come through the state of New York, um, basically from you know uh, Buffalo, New York, through Rochester, all the way up through Plattsburgh and into like Vermont, like Stowe. This will be the last full totality solar eclipse in our area until the 24th century. So unless some people out there are thinking about cryogenic storage, this will be your last chance to actually see a, a full eclipse just a few hours drive from, from New York City. So I highly, highly recommend you think about doing it. Um, it's not too late. Go out there and book an Airbnb or be, uh, book a hotel. Things are going to so sell out like crazy. In 2017, when I went to Jackson Hole, I ended up booking a, a hotel room like a year in advance. I think I paid like 200 bucks a night. When I was going out there a week before, the hotel offered to pay me eight hundred dollars a night for me to give up my reservation. So it's going to get nuts. So definitely think about this if it's something you want to do. In July of this of this year, we did an excellent six class series on eclipses. Um, I think we recorded those. So if you want, send an email to classes at triple a org, and and you can get the the recordings. We might probably do a a free. Um, uh, session on getting ready for the eclipse, maybe in January or February. We're talking about doing that. This is this is big, right? This is the last one in, in our area. Um, 
you don't have to travel that far. You don't have to go to Texas for this. Uh, and if anyone who hasn't been uh, to, to, to totality, it is really uh, amazing. It is, it is a once in a lifetime type of thing to do. It, it's not just a bucket list thing. It, it can be just transformational. So it's, it's really an amazing uh, event and I highly, highly recommend uh, you seriously think about it if you haven't. It's great for kids too. I took my kids who were all, um, you know, college kids and they're all complaining like crazy when we went, they're like, oh, come, we can't go to a beach vacation. I don't want to go here, blah, blah. And then afterwards they're all like, oh, that was so amazing. Right. So it was really a great thing. So don't, don't, don't knock it, really think about it. And I really, really highly recommend, um, that you seriously consider doing it. So that that was my spiel. (laughs) Hey, we have to stop. We're all done. I just want to say one last thing, join the club. If you haven't joined, this is a great place to learn stuff. It's just it's such an extraordinary thing with a, such a great community of people who really care and are very generous and willing to share. Uh, AAA is the place to be. So thank you all. And uh, good night, Gracie. <laughs> good night. <laughs>